Hi everyone, it's Simon Mannering here, the CEO and founder of We First in Los Angeles, California. We're a strategic consultancy that drives growth and impact for purpose-driven brands, for those of you who haven't met us. And I'm really excited today because we've got a chance to chat with a friend and colleague and really launch this idea of perspectives on purpose. But before I dive into that, I just wanted to remind everyone that this webinar is for you, for you to have your questions answered, whether you're a solopreneur, whether you're a high growth company, whether you're a complex, large, multifaceted you know, enterprise, either here in the United States or around the world. So if you have a question, just go down to the dialogue box, hit Q&A and enter your question there. And then a large portion of today will be dedicated to answering people's questions. Again, this is all about you, so don't be shy. Really, what's that thing that's keeping you up at night? What's that thing in and around purposeful business or scaling through purpose that you're struggling with? So Thomas and I can you know, offer whatever advice or guidance we can. So just click on the dialog box and you're away. And why are we talking about perspectives on purpose today? Well, I wanted to share the context. You know, 2020 was such a sobering time of reflection. And as I was thinking over the holidays around just how dramatic the fallout of COVID was and how it compromised physical health, but also economic health around the world, it kind of gave even greater urgency to a dialogue that folks like Thomas and ourselves and so many others have been driving for a long time, which is how does business solve for these large challenges that we're facing? How do we work together in new ways to actually meet these challenges we're facing? And so, you know, Perspectives on Purpose is really designed to bring together practitioners and thought leaders who can share what they're seeing is working, what needs to improve and how they're thinking about it. So I'm really excited to invite a friend and colleague, Thomas, I think Thomas and I have known each other for probably eight, 10 years around the sort of um, sustainability, purpose, impact space. And, you know, this hopefully is going to be a really valuable dialogue in terms of, you know, different perspectives on how purposeful business is most effectively executed. So if we go to the next slide, before I, we start chatting with Thomas, I'd just like to bring everyone's attention to his new book, The Hero Trap, which you can find at thomascolster.com. Um, you know, and as you can see in the short synopsis there, brands today are firmly focused on social and environmental issues. But, you know, there's a bandwagon there, you know, where a lot of them are piling into this honeypot, whether it be oceans, plastics or diversity. And yet at the same time, people, especially younger demographics, are becoming more distrustful of these efforts, which they can see as stunts or cheap, cheap marketing efforts, you know, purpose washing, cause washing, green washing, washing. And so Thomas is really focused on what does that post purpose era look like, you know, because you've got to be mindful that brands can be demonized by others or, you know, really not serve themselves well by showing up inauthentically. And, you know, you've got to make sure that brands really do lean into the authenticity of what they're doing so that they can be a partner in people's dreams, aspirations, and put creativity, creativity first. So please do check it out, The Hero Trap at thomascolster.com. Speaking of the man himself, let's bring on my friend and colleague, Thomas, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, Simon. Thank you so much for inviting me to this little kind of coffee chat. Yeah. Uh, I'm calling it all the way from Copenhagen. So if it looks a little bit dark here, that's why, you know, it's, uh, it's about eight o'clock here, so kind of easing into the little end of day. Exactly, exactly. So I brought, I brought, I brought some coffee as well. So I hope all of you out there have a have a bit of coffee and a sip as well. Fantastic, and uh, you know, don't worry, we're kind of on the same place because at Copenhagen it's a little bit dark and it's you know later at night here emotionally in LA it's a little bit dark sometimes. <laughs> it's like terrifying to walk out the door. We've been like COVID central here in the US for so long. But it is encouraging the numbers are getting better. And, and, you know, I think of some of the causes for optimism right now. There was a really good commitment to stakeholder capitalism over at Davos. Larry Fink, you know, the CEO of the largest money management firm in the world is really doubling down on how we've got to address climate crisis. You know, the US has re-entered the Paris Climate Agreement. There's a lot of good things going on. I was so excited to talk to you because you know, you've got that European perspective, you know, you deal with global brands, but also, you know, you're there you are in Copenhagen and you see what's going on. Give us a sense of the state of purposeful business in, in Europe. I know that's a gross generalization, but in Europe more broadly and just what, what your perspective is. Yeah, I think my, the, the thing that, that um, I mean, we, we probably met each other a decade ago, as you said, introductory wise. And, mm -hmm. and at the time I was, 
very much into kind of the classical view on purpose because at the time there weren't a lot of um, companies talking about purpose. It was the likes, you know, of Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's. And we kind of all, all know those types of companies. And I think not just being phased out of here in, in Copenhagen, because we might be a little bit more advanced in terms of especially some of the environmental uh, issues. But just in general, I saw, hey, wait a moment. I'm a big believer in purpose, but I started to see this disconnect that you, that you mentioned in the introduction. Right. And I think that's becoming more and more uh, a global phenomenon because, you know, I should be extremely happy that all these brands are kind of going into the purpose space. They're, you know, there's not a day when you don't hear a CEO uh, stand on a stage somewhere and talk about what they believe in, the SDGs, sustainable development goals, or you know, ocean preservation or whatever it is. But it still seems like we're not moving fast enough. The change is not happening fast enough. And what I'm witnessing is people are becoming extremely cynical towards these efforts. Right. So if we don't solve this trust gap, yeah, yeah. we're not gonna succeed because I still believe business is a, a potential force for good. Yeah. But if people don't trust it, we're not gonna move anywhere. No, I absolutely agree. If there is cynicism, people are gonna be disincentivized to participate. And there was actually research done um, by Per Sorens. He did a TED talk around uh, why global warming, that communication over the last decade, 15 years since Al Gore and so on didn't work. And the research yeah. actually found that the negative storytelling, the alarmists, the fear mongering actually led to passivity and cynicism and disengagement. So we've got to be really mindful about how we're showing up authentically, but also how we're communicating. I want to, I want to ask you a question. I actually was on a call to uh, somebody this morning and they asked exactly the question you mentioned, which is, what's your perception of Europe? Why is Europe ahead of us in the US on sustainability and ESG commitments and so on? What would you say to that? Why, why do they seem a little bit further down the track? Oh, you know, uh, in so many ways, I mean, Europe, Europe is as diverse as <laughs> you know, the States and the US can be. So, you know, it's not that there's a sort of unified European thinking, I would say. Uh, um, I think we've, um, we've been through our shit, to be honest. I mean, we've, we've, um, you know, some of the goals that we've had to deal with in terms of nationalism, uh, for example, hasn't sure. been, uh, sure. and, and, the, and the populism in many, in many countries. I think in terms of the environment, I do see that, especially Northern Europe, we might have been leading that um, and being a bit more further ahead. Um, why that is, whether that's like a cultural thing or whatever it is, I don't know. I, I feel I was kind of brought up with it. Right. And, and, the, the really and the really positive thing is that it's not politicized uh, anymore. So it started right. being politicized. You know, if you go five, five years back, it was something where the political parties could argue. But what's really great now is that whether you're on the, on, on the left wing or on the right wing, everybody kind of agrees that we got to stand up and do something about the climate where, sure. you know, I'm sometimes being appalled by what I'm seeing in, in the US where yeah. it's almost become like a sort of like a political game. Um, right. when, when we're all affected and it's only gonna get worse. <laughs> I mean, like I, it's a game where I won, you are, you know, you, you know, you won, but we all lose. It's, it's maddening to me. Um, so tell me this, I mean, you know, you're committed in the hero trap to really call out those shortcomings of brands in the, whether it's their mindset or their behavior that can not only mean that they don't have the impact they wanna have, but also it can really hurt their reputation and like disengage their audiences. Like give us a sense of some of the areas you think they're failing or blind spots they've got to watch out for. Yeah, for me, basically the, the, the hero trap is uh, a book about leadership, basically. And I think we really need to kind of change the way we look at leadership. Yeah. And one of the questions that kind of sparked my own journey was in fact that I said, okay, I've been involved in this purpose space for so long. Yeah. But kind of what brands, what leaders, what organizations have really created or have, have really uh, played a meaningful role in my life, Right. have really changed something in my life. Because if we right. talk about purpose, is it just like these kind of- It's big, a concept, an idea, yeah. Exactly. Like everybody talks <laughs> about it by the end of the day, but if it just kind of 
create change, it doesn't, it doesn't really uh, push the needle forward. So most of the time when I hear about purpose, you hear companies go out and say, you know, we believe in this and that, our values are this and that. But I mean, the issue is that everybody today, as, as you said in the introduction, everybody yeah. today is claiming to be, you know, more climate friendly. Yeah. You, know, you can basically not go into the supermarket without everybody trying to kind sure. of play messiahs, et cetera. So rather than having this inside out perspective, what I found out was we're asking the wrong questions all along the way. So it's not about the kind of sum and cynic, why do you exist as a business? Because mm -hmm. those values don't differentiate you anymore. It's mm -hmm. really about who can you help people become? So it's really about making people feel the change. And let, let me give you an example. Yeah, so, let, let push in on that a little bit more because I think a lot of people think about it in terms of defining their why and taking it to market, yeah. Yeah, so so take uh, IKEA. I mean, um, they're just across from the bridge where I live. So right. Swedish furniture Massive, maker. massive, you know, sustainability massive. leader. You know, they're now <laughs> exactly. recycling their furniture, which is amazing, you know? Exactly, and I think they they've been on a quite interesting transformation in the sense that they were in a journey where they had to face a lot of issues in the beginning in the business models in operations etc right. but the thing they are now is the one billion pledge you know how can they get one billion customers to live more sustainably right. so it's really about answering that question who can you help people become and i think that's the primary focus you need to have Sure. Because I think people are tired of these sort of leadership brands, all the preaching. And in the US, I think it's even gone uh, too far. Yeah, there's this a lot of that yeah. idea. Yeah, this whole yeah. idea about brand activism. For me, it's nonsense. Yeah. It's, it's divisive. It's not really changing anything. For me, it's really saying, you know, we want to help you live more sustainably. We want to uh, make you live more healthy. And, and so for me, the hero trap is when a company goes out and say, you know, we are so and so sustainable, or we are such a diverse company, because it's basically not about that. It's about helping me face some of the biases that I have, or face some of the stereotypes that I have. That's the that's for me is the sort of brand heaven. And I call those brands transformative brands. And is there not a way where it's not so much either or brands doing it all themselves, or stakeholders, whoever they are, citizens, customers, consumers, whatever you want to whoever you want to focus on, they kind of go hand in hand. Like I think of a Ben and Jerry's and they seem as much committed to an issue like, I don't know, climate. And then they're out there marching with other climate concerned people in a march. Like is, is it not where they can go hand in hand in some way, the, the brand and the stakeholders working together? I think basically it is about how you view uh, leadership, uh, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, and I, Unfortunately, I've witnessed way too many uh, uh, self-important brands in this space mm -hmm. that put themselves up on this pedestal and say, yo, we're going to save the world. Take Patagonia, for example, brilliant mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. They go out there and say, ah, oh, we believe in X, Y, Z. And nobody is a hero. I mean, if you, if you try and take that hero's pedestal, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you take a much more humble approach and realize mm -hmm. that change doesn't begin with the company, as you, you, you touched on there, and I really, I really wholeheartedly agree with what you said in terms of climate communication. You know, most of that stuff, it's like it's like the the, the anti smoking ads. You yeah. know, you you don't you don't avoid the cigarettes, you avoid the advertising. So for me, you know, people are tired of these sort of brands that go out there and say do this and that, and you're wrong and you're right or whatever it might be. I actually want a brand, a leader that can help me towards some of the things that I want to achieve in my life. And I think that's why it's, it's fundamentally quite a different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. And I could see with the, with the many brands and leaders that I interviewed, very few of them actually did live up to being a truly transformative brand because sure. many of them were way too, um, uh, way too self-important. And give us an example of a brand who's doing it well, because I mean, obviously, the thesis of we first is this collaborative approach to things, you know, it's putting the collective interest first and everyone's participating and so on. So I do think it, you know, it's some, it's all stakeholders have to work together, but give us an example of a brand that you think is doing it well, getting this balance right. 
Yeah, so I was obviously interviewing tons of brands and tons of leaders across many, many different industries. But but one of the ones that I really loved uh, is a uh, South African health insurance company that might actually be in the US as well called Discovery, or they are in the US. And, and they're what I don't like to call it a purpose. I call it the transformative promise because it's basically a promise about change that you want to enable in people's lives. So it's very concise. It's not this do good for people and planet type stuff. It's very concise. And their transformative promise is incentivizing people to live healthier. So that becomes a rallying cry that everybody within the organization and outside the organization understands. And because for me, what I want to understand is how do we unlock change? How do we get people to act on climate change? How do you get people to act on things that are important in their lives? And, and some of the surveys they have done is in fact that the people uh, who take part in one of the programs called Vitality are actually um, exercising 5.2 uh, days more per month. So what I've, uh, what I, what I've uh, done in the study is I, I compared the classical purposeful approach and purposeful commercials with the transformative commercials. And again and again and again, the results show that people are in average 29.4% more ma- motivated to act on the coaching approach rather than the kind of purpose preacher approach. Right. And just a reminder to everyone, as this discussion provokes questions, do go down to the chat box, put those questions in there so that Thomas and I can answer them towards the end. Um, And so, you know, what is the downside of approaching this the wrong way? Like we've seen the most extreme examples of disingenuous behavior, like, you know, VF diesel emission scandal or in Europe or in the US and also over here in the US, the Wells Fargo banking scandal with, you know, fraudulent accounts being opened up. They're these egregious examples, but this is a subtle distinction that you're talking about. Are there any sort of um, cautionary tales you might share with us in terms of what can go wrong if you don't have the right approach? I see it again and again, even even with brands that I before would have applauded as truly purposeful brands. And I think the, the, the risk of running into the hero trap is that you start to... Uh, disengage people, they start losing trust in you. So let me give you an example. I mean, innocent Jews, we all know them. Obviously today they've been fully acquired by Coca-Cola, but I think, I mean, at the time, I think a lot of us loved that brand. We liked the approach. We liked the way that the kind of tone and style and stuff like that. Right. Just the other day I saw, you know, uh, commercial running on TV, them talking about how they they now uh, have even 20% more recycle plastic, bioplastic, whatever it is. So this kind of typical hero approach to, to this whole um, packaging issue, which is obviously a big thing in Europe and across the world, but how, what's, what's the deal? What, why is that interesting? This company going out and talking about itself and it's almost like it's alienating me. I have a choice and I don't, if I don't like what Innocent is doing, I'll buy a juice from another company that has its packaging all sorted out. So I think this idea about, you know, putting these things out there and, and being, what I see a lot in the US is these, um, as I mentioned earlier, brand activism things, where it's right. almost like the brands think that the solution is just shouting louder or saying, oh, we believe more than you in diversity. You know, if you, if you look at the Nike ad that ran uh, recently, um, you know, uh, what was it? Believe in us, believe in sport or whatever, believe in diversity. Mm-hmm. For me, again, it's, it's for the company going out there and saying, you know, we are a diverse company and that's a hero trap rather than what I think they were very good at uh, in the beginning was to take a much more humble approach and ask you to maybe think twice about some of the biases that all of us have. Yeah, I think, I mean, help me understand this. A, a, a client or a brand or a company or a CEO might say, well, we've got to have our own house in order. So we're working on our mm-hmm. supply chain because up till now we've been off the hook and we've made such yeah. a mess and we've been compounding the plastics problem and so on. Um, yeah. And, you know, we paid lip service to DNI or DEI, diversity and inclusion, and now we need to get our house in order. So that's kind of one half of the equation. The other half of the equation mm-hmm. is, okay, how you engage external stakeholders, other people out yeah. there. So, I mean, I do think brands are increasingly holding their own feet to the fire because otherwise 
consumers will call them out. They'll say, hey, you know, the way you're making stuff, the way you're manufacturing it, the way you're distributing it is harmful. So yeah. we're not even going to talk to you unless you get your own house in order. What would you say to that? But you don't become good just because you say you're good. It's like Jesus bragging, you know, look at that old lady over there, the widow lady, you know, I just gave her a side back. That's sort of the, the, the mentality of most companies that I absolutely hate today. It's, it's kind of like if I was a child and I, I, I cleaned up the mess in my room, I don't necessarily run a 30 second ad or put up a big billboard to my mom saying, look at it, mom, I cleaned up my room. Mm -hmm. I think the mentality of a lot of young people today is basically their company, their CEO, you screwed it up to begin with. Mm -hmm. Why are you bragging about it now? You, you know, so I think it's much more about understanding what, what can you do for me as a company or as a person, as an individual that had dreams and aspirations. We know that young people are concerned about the climate. So rather than talking about all the great stuff you're doing, think about how you can make that part of the behavior change that we are all on. How can you help yeah. people live greener and better lives? And, and one of the things, for example, that I think IKEA is doing well is, you know, opening up, they have a store, for example, in Greenwich in the UK, they're mm -hmm. opening up the store for kind of do-it-yourself classes, mm -hmm. uh, plant-based cooking classes. Uh, they're thinking about how they can reinvent their now 50-year-old model with the kind of labyrinth way of going into a mall, mm -hmm. just a couple of hundred meters up from the road where I live. Yeah. Again, about the who, the role they can play in the customer's lives. It's all about uh, enabling uh, more sustainable living at home. And they have like 150 square meter space. And wow. in that space, there sits like eight designers ready to help you make your, uh, make your, your house prettier, help you design your dream house. And in, in that way, I think they enable me rather than kind of standing on that purpose pedestal and screaming, you know, we're so sustainable, we're 20% this, 20% that, because people aren't buying it anymore. Yeah, and, and I want to come to that sort of um, external stakeholder engagement and behavior change in a second. But one, one question I have is, well, then how does, you know, it's kind of like a CEO or a C-suite, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. You know, if they don't do anything about their supply chain or talk about what they're doing on the D&I side, then you know, they're doing it, but no one knows about it. And the research out there does tend to show that millennials and younger demos do want to know what good a company's doing, whether it's as an employee or a consumer. So how should a CEO or an executive approach this? Because, you know, if they have been off the hook for so long and they are doing good things and there is a sense of the marketplace wants to know about that, how do they get yeah. that tone right in your mind? Exactly. There's, I think there's so much... Uh, nonsense in this space that we just take for given that, mm -hmm. that doesn't absolutely make any sense. I mean, take these corporate pledges. I just right. absolutely hate them. I mean, um, let's say you want to lose weight, then we know peer pressure, it's great. You say, you know, I'm on a mission, I want to, I want to lose a couple of pounds and stuff. That's fine. That does promote change. So, and you talked about that. I think the issue is when you have companies that go out and say, we want to do this by 2040 or 2030. Right. Because we're not going to sit and ra around and wait for your company to make that change. And, and let me give you uh, just, just an analogy. I like to kind of <laughs> make things simple. Yeah. So let's say after our little coffee conversation here, yeah. I catch my girlfriend uh, uh, being unfaithful. Right. And I'm like, you know, honey, what are you doing with another man? And she's like, oh, Thomas, yeah, okay, you know. I shouldn't have done that. But you know what? Towards 2030, I'm going to sleep a little bit less with him each and every day until 2030 and we're all back together. Sure. And that's, I think, what a lot of companies are trying to sell yeah. to each and every one of us. And yes, change is difficult. But the basis of this is it comes back to the leadership. It comes back to being able to clearly answer what is the role that your brand want to play in my life? Yeah. Who can you help me become? Yeah. And how can you put me on that change journey? And what I've seen again and again with the companies who do this is they can measure it. They can follow up on it. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, yeah. it doesn't become these kind of nice words um, you see written on, uh, you know, on, on the wall in the, in the corporate headquarters. Yeah, I think hollow words don't really serve anyone 
But um, I have a, you know, it's hard. A lot of these companies have these huge capital investments. Just think about the energy sector. You know, that's a really problematic one because there's so many mixed motives and there's sort of monopolies and all of that. But they are yeah. trying to change, you know, yeah. and, you know, they've got these distress assets, these orphan assets, these investments over decades and so on. Doing that change is hard, you know, yeah. and to be responsible, yes, to shareholders, but also to our future. So I agree with you, it's not unimportant in any way whatsoever. It's absolutely critical, but it's, you know, it's, a, it's not a light switch. It's very, very difficult for, for them to do it overnight. The good news that I'm seeing is that you see the Black Rocks holding P&G's feet to the fire at their shareholder meeting, saying you've got to change more quickly, or NASDAQ isn't going to list companies without diversity. I mean, you're starting to see these other kind of market signals which almost penalize companies for not changing more quickly. But it, you know, when you've got these larger legacy brands that have been around 20, 30, 40, now that's not an 100 years, it's not an excuse, but I get a sense that a lot of these CEOs really want to do it. They've got to kind of take the company with them. Let me shift gears to you know, behavior change because the tone that you're speaking about, the sort of posture of the brand is absolutely critical. Um, how do you make sure that when you're reaching out to consumers or the people who buy your stuff, that you don't suffer the same fate again, where the way you talk to them is preachy or prescriptive or telling them what to do. How do you make sure that when you communicate to a consumer about the behavior change or to help them realize the change they want to create or be the person they want to be, they don't go, hey, back off brand, don't tell me what to do, even though your heart's in the right place. Do you know what I mean? You're trying to enable them to, to be a change agent. How do you get that right? Uh, you know, well, I think obviously there are, uh, you know, cultural differences to what people want to be told by companies, et cetera. But, but basically, at least what I've, I've seen again and again in research is that people actually do appreciate brands right. that, uh, that, uh, um, that demands more, mm -hmm. that says, you know, what you're doing right now, you're not doing enough rather than just going out there and talking about themselves. So I think it's really about this mentality that, and, I, and basically, as I said, I mean, I think the best leaders in my life have been the ones that have helped me grow. Right. So leaders shouldn't go out there and talk about how good they are or their mm -hmm. vision and all that stuff. But it's really much more about enabling my vision. So, so what... Well, you mentioned least, Ikea. You mentioned Ikea. Yeah, Who would be yeah. another good example of a company that you see in Europe perhaps driving or inspiring behavior change? And how do they go about it? Like, who, who might be a good example? Yeah, I can, give, I can give you another example actually from the US. It, it's just also to kind of showcase the, the bigger thing that is at stake right now. And that's also why I'm starting to talk about the kind of post-purpose era. Right. Because, you know, the last 10 years or so, I think we started positioning companies and products on the societal difference they were making. Mm -hmm. right. So for example, a more environmentally friendly car. Today, what I'm seeing is really that that's not what people are buying anymore, especially young people in our very privileged part of the world. Uh, they're buying the transformation. They're buying, you know, they, they want to be a more conscious traveler. That's essentially what they're buying. And maybe it's not so strange that we see business models being challenged. I mean, if you look mm -hmm. at Tom's shoes, mm -hmm. you know, that might have been cool five, 10 years ago. That sort of tokenism. Oh, look at my shoes. I'm a cool, conscious uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a kind of cool, conscious young kid. Yeah. But, but that doesn't really add value anymore. What really adds value is when you, um, when you achieve something, when you aspire towards something, when you make something happen. I think this is, uh, this is the real shift. And I think, you know, having a book uh, that came out during the pandemic, yeah. that, 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 wasn't, that wasn't fun because obviously I was, I was afraid whether that trend would be accelerated. But I think by the end of the day, it's about self-actualization. I think we've seen again and again and again during the pandemic, people embracing sourdough, people embracing baking, um, connecting with the community. All these things are very kind of basic human values. Right. And the brands and the leaders that understand that that's how you build meaningful brands. Right. That's how you find a meaningful role to play are definitely the ones that are going to win going forward rather than playing a hero. Um, it's much more about making me the hero in my own life. 
and one, one and, of and, the, and, and, yeah. no, and let me give you an example. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, yeah, so, um, and, and these are just two amazing guys. It's Tom and Max, and they uh, created this company called District Vision. So basically they sell running glasses. I didn't know okay. that you needed running glasses, but apparently you right. do. Right. But, um, and they're maybe a little bit more beautifully designed than many other running glasses out there. But what they talk about is a very kind of clear transformative promise because it's about mindful running. And I think yeah. a lot of uh, you listening to this uh, conversation here today know this feeling when you're running and you're thinking about, oh, I can't make it to the next lamppost. You start yeah. thinking too much. The two things aren't combined. So basically what they're preaching is mindful running. They do mindful running classes. Uh, even today, they actually teach inmates and prisons mindful training. Mm -hmm. And everybody who connects with that brand know what the brand is about. It knows where the brands want to take them. And so you feel there's a very kind of clear interdependence. There's a very kind of clear mission. And it's mm -hmm. not preaching. It's something where you talk about the kind of community feeling, you know, the feeling yeah. between stakeholders. And, and now there's this connecting tissue where people unite around something that inspires each and every one of us rather than just being this kind of old-fashioned view of the leader, often as a, as a male guy, like a Steve Jobs saying, you know, we're going this direction. It's really about a great leadership. It's really about finding that little fire within everybody and, 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 and making it possible for them to kind of light it themselves. And how do you then, you know, hold kind of your collaborators, your consumers accountable? Because as we know, and everyone watching this knows, the issues we're solving for are so darn serious. I mean, COVID and, you know, climate and social inequities as demonstrated through the Black Lives Matter um, protests around the world. You know, these are burning issues that are having a direct impact on our daily lives. So in as much as a brand is working with a consumer, a citizen to you know, enable the change they want for themselves, how then does a brand kind of go, okay, we're achieving something because you say you want brands to do something, you know, to, uh, to have social proof of their impact. So how do you, have you seen any good examples of brands out there that are kind of measuring that progress in, in this dynamic? The best, I think the best social, the best social proof and, and the best proof by the end of the day is I, if I can feel a difference. Right. It's, and, 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 as I said in the beginning of this conversation, one of the one of the fundamental questions I asked myself was, in fact, what brand lead organization have actually created a meaningful difference in my life? Right. And it's crazy that so few brands came up. One of them that came up is actually a Danish company called uh, Austin, which means Austin. seasons in Danish. Austin, right. yes. This is the energy <laughs> company, right? I mean, they're amazing. No, that's that's actually uh, Austel. So, but oh, it's it sounds oh, pretty similar. <laughs> well, my Danish is uh, you know my Danish is a bit rough this morning. What can I tell you? You know what can I tell yeah, you? Yeah, no, we we can we can actually go back to Austel and afterwards because yeah. they also have a very interesting story to tell. No, so Austel and actually does these. Um, you you definitely have them uh, in in LA as well, but they deliver this box of farm fresh produce to your doorstep. Right. That comes from community farms, etc. Yeah. But when I interviewed the CEO. He didn't talk about, you know, we're in a company on a mission to greenify everyone and, and everybody, and we believe in this and that. No, he talks about um, Earth Connection, and it's really about your own ability to kind of connect with the produce, connect with plant-based cooking. Yeah. And, and it's one of the brands that actually have taught me to cook more plant-based. Right. And today I feel like I'm a kind of fairly okay vegan or vegetarian chef. And that makes me even less price sensitive because now I feel, hey, wait a moment. Here's a brand that understands me. Uh, I can see from day one to today how much more plant-based I'm living. Right. I think it's exactly that sort of mindset. I mean, if you look at Oatly, uh, that's you know created such a stir, in fact, I mean, they're on a mission as well. They're on a very, very clear transformative mission to get us to understand that, oh, you can have milk that's not from a cow. Right, right. Very, very, very simple premise. And I think, I don't think leaders or organizations necessarily forget the purpose per se. A lot of companies was founded on 
you know, a visionary CEO's, uh, you know, mission and values, etc. What they forget is actually who they're there for and how they can play a meaningful role in those people's lives. That's where this gap exists. And this is where um, the real leaders in this space should be heading. They, they need to figure out what role they want to play in my life. You know, it's a, it's a hard one because it is an, a moving target. It's an evolving conversation. As we all know, over the last certainly five to seven decades, shareholder capitalism, you know, the primacy of the shareholder has driven business and that's allowed for all the excesses of business, this disproportion of wealth and all the infrastructure and social breakdowns that have been exposed even more so lately, but have been around for a long time. You know, now we've got this conversation that's been catalyzed by, you know, Larry Fink and Business Roundtable and Michael Porter at Harvard and so many others around stakeholder capitalism. So it's sort of like the marketplace is catching up to, you know, this more expansive view of who they've got to serve. And there's always those leaders out front. Remember, everyone was talking about Paul Polman and Indra Nui and Richard Branson, and that was about it forever, to the point that yeah. I actually banned myself from actually having a Paul Polman quote in any presentation. <laughs> then I'd have to, you know, I'd, I'd thrown in the towel. Um, but they're such a wonderful uh, leadership example. Um, so, you know, what's your advice to those, that solopreneur, that leader of a mid-sized company, that CEO, who is getting there as fast as they can. Like, like they, they recognize they're getting their head around balancing act between they've got to serve their shareholders or their investor, but at the same time, they've got to serve our future. You know, what, what would you say to them? I think that's one of the key issues with um, standing too high on the purpose pedestal. Right. I often talk about purpose being a two-headed purpose monster in the sense that one head is talking about profit and another one is talking about purpose. And we all know what happens in the boardroom again and again and again. Uh, profit wins, um, even in the companies that we actually do love. Very few companies would actually, in uh, the short and long term, really genuinely sacrifice profit. Each and every time we see something comes out, great stories. You know, we're talking about a couple of millions. We talk about small percentages. So it's not a lot of stake. I love when I see small startups coming into this space, eco-entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, they're risking their whole business model on what they believe in. Right. But where I saw a big difference between and, and trying to avoid that kind of purpose hero trap was in fact, when your purpose is interlinked, when your purpose is about my transformation, then the more successful you are at transforming me, the more you live up to your purpose, the more profitable a business you're having. So for example, Discovery, the example I mentioned you, the health insurance company, yeah. because they've been so good at incentivizing their uh, customers to live healthier, obviously they pay less in premiums and it's a much more profitable business model. Right. And I think that's the sort of change that we need to look at because else it just becomes fluffy words again and, and we know the fallback and we know quite often also how employees internally uh, go up against the leadership. You know, we see this in, in Google and other companies where staff don't think the company is doing enough, where staff think that, oh, maybe we shouldn't take that contract with the US military because right. that's not aligned with what we believe in. Sure. So I think a clear, yeah. So I think a clear way to avoid that is again to be focused on the on the change that you want to enable in people's lives. And so let's go to questions. Um, again, you know, this has probably inspired a lot of questions in folks. So you know, you go Hopefully. to the chat, yeah, you go to the chat box, <laughs> and I'm going to um, bring up a question here. We've got one from Roger, and Roger says, Thomas, would you agree that transformational, transformative leadership requires extracting your ego out of the process, the leader as hero is deeply rooted in society. I absolutely agree, Roger. Very, very, very good question. I think, you know, and this, this shouldn't actually be about politics, but I'm, I'm, I'm just going to share the US example. But when, um, when Barack Obama stepped down and he did his last speech in, uh, in Chicago, and we all, all know he got elected on this Yes, We Can campaign, I think he said something that was quite beautiful because he said, yes, we can. It's not about people believing in his ability to create change. 
but it was about each and every one of us believing in our own ability to create change. And yeah. for me, that's always been the best leadership. And I think some of the best leaders I've met through my life have in fact been women because right. in, in so many aspects, I think women have been much better at taking the ego out of the equation. Right. And, 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 and so I think... I think we, you know, because what, one of the things I've seen during this period is, and, and some of these CEO, CEOs are known for a while, and suddenly you have a CEO that is not known for his stance on environment or social issues, suddenly taking the stage and talking about how much he cares about the environment, how much he cares about sustainable development goals. And, and for me, he doesn't need to do that. He doesn't need to take that stage. It's not necessary. Let others speak on his behalf. Let, let, let your customers feel it. Let your stakeholders feel it. You don't need to take the stage. Right, right. Okay. And I'll go to the next uh, question. Um, you know, if you're, oh, here it's from Sandy. If you are starting out as a solopreneur, what is the first thing you should do to make sure you don't fall guilty of putting, making yourself the hero? Yeah, it's quite unfortunately, quite a common mistake uh, that's being done by startups. In fact, that they always tell the kind of founder story. Oh, this was what I kind of hated. This was what I loved. So this is what I changed. And, and so again, they forget who they are there for and the meaningful role they can play in people's lives. They, they get self-obsessed by, oh, look at this. I did a t-shirt made out of uh, plastics that I collected from the ocean. And people aren't buying those values and that mission anymore. There's so much competition in that space. So again, nice. I would, as a startup, I would really kind of ask yourself that fundamental question, who can help people become? And, and, and one of the things I actually added in the book was a, a framework I called the arrow, which is okay. um, inspired by a, a psychotherapy and coaching because both those disciplines are goal-oriented. So right. ask yourself who can help people come. I think that's that's a good good uh, starting point as, a, as an entrepreneur. Okay, great, thanks. And from Teresa, um, our business is sustainable luxury. We see virtual, we see virtual, so we are looking to target, um, oh, we sell virtually. So we are looking to target the younger generations. Um, and here in Europe, there is prejudice against luxury. How do we de address a defensive younger generation um, in this client pool who may not see the heritage as usually being sustainable and, and, and they are cynical? Legacy builders are often um, heads of heritage brands. So uh, she's wondering how to be a new player in that space. How do we change this dynamic and introduce a new dialogue on purpose? Extremely interesting question. Love that question. And I think it's definitely needed uh, in that industry, uh, especially if you go into the precious stone industry, uh, there definitely needs to be something happening there. Um, I think, again, um, think about how you can bring people on this journey. I mean, again, about the role that you can play. Maybe a lot of people, you know, they still want to look great. They, they might think that gold looks great in them. How can you bring them on that journey where you don't sacrifice um, the planet, where, where you don't um, have social issues? So I think, again, what, what I looked at is really what, what, what areas can you touch on? How can you connect people to that kind of bigger thing? How can you involve them in the story? How can you make them part of the story? Mm -hmm. Because most of the time, again, what I see coming out from uh, the luxury brands these days is again talking about, you know, oh, no animal, well, uh, you know, um, no animal testing, uh, you know, the crocodile skins are from farm crocodiles and all that stuff. Again, it's very kind of navel gazing. So my advice to you would be think about, you know, if they're cynical, think about how they can be part of this journey. Think about if you're cynical, you're the one who can transform the jewelry industry. You're the one who can change this stuff. Right. Um, so make them part of the journey. Right, make them part of the journey. Okay, great, thank you. And um, I'm looking at questions here. We've got for a question from Michael. We wanna promote companies for what they are doing to improve the world, aside from selling their quality products and services at fair prices. Do you have any suggestions for what we should not do in this effort? <laughs> 
um, again, I think um, a, lo a lot of this is about obviously the leadership that you want to take as a brand and, and getting the story right from the, from the onset. And, and maybe asking yourself, uh, um, why does this matter so much to you? What's, what's, what's the bigger narrative? I think very few people wake up in the morning and think, you know, I'm going to save the planet. But there might be other things. Maybe uh, you're a busy housewife or busy, busy dad in the kitchen, and you want to cook to your to your to your children. But you feel about, bad about the food waste. Right. Again, here's a role that you can play. And again, I see in the, um, for example, the car space. I think a lot have happened there as well, right. uh, where it used to be brands talking a lot about how environmentally friendly the cars uh, have been. I think now they've been a bit scared about that. <laughs> they moved right. into social issues. Um, so, um, and secondly, I think um, how, how, can, how can people do something? How can you enable them to do something? So a second thing I've added in the book is something I call the wheel. And so when you figured out your transformative promise, who can you help people become? Think about how you can activate that across the marketing mix. And there's so many ways you can do it. I mean, uh, just because before all of you uh, just joined, uh, Sam and I talked about webinars. I think all of yeah. us are doing it these days. And one of the things we tried to do uh, was, because it's a big thing, I believe the more you involve people, uh, the more passionate people are. Obviously, that's, that's simple leadership. Nobody wants to be dictated. And, and one of the things that I, I researched in the book, and which was difficult, was price. Right. How can you make people part of the, 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 the pricing of the product. So mm -hmm. one thing we did when we were doing our webinars was in fact that we asked people, pay as you want. And then we explained people, you can pay zero bucks, right. but, but eventually I won't be able to uh, drink a cup of coffee and run my business. Right. You can pay 49 and it's, you know, sort of kind of running around. If you pay 69, we're actually turning a profit. Right. So I think it's really about thinking how you can put people's passion and creativity at the very heart of the brand and the whole marketing mix. And there's so much that could be explored um, as well there. Right, great. Um, from Rachel, I see uh, Thomas has pointed at the same time Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's um, Nike with Colin Kaepernick do get a lot of mind share. People seem to buy into these brands. How do they do this authentically? Are they being rewarded for acting as heroes or are they doing something else? Um, yeah, so you, you mentioned three, uh, three brands there. Um, uh, Nike, Patagonia, and Ben and & Jerry's. Exactly. Yeah, they're, they're three quite different brands, in fact. I mean, if you think about Nike, they are, in essence, what I would call a transformative brand because they're on a very, very clear mission in terms of pushing us further, achieving more uh, in the sports that we do. Uh, so they, they're, they're very clear transformative brands. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes they they go out and they do the wrong thing because they forget uh, that they are about transformation and they're not about uh, a screaming activist brand. Um, I think Ben & Jerry's uh, to me is one of those brands that are in um, a sort of a mess, to be honest, <laughs> because Why is that? Um, if, if you think about it, I don't think that brand promise rings that true anymore. I mean, if I look at, just in my neighborhood, I probably have four to five ice cream makers I can choose from that have high quality organic ingredients. Um, their, their mission appeals to me. I think what happened to Ben and Jerry's today, it's just become this kind of bland commodity product. It's really not the greatest of ice cream. It's an okay ice cream. And I, I seriously doubt if they can keep going on this kind of activism. I think at some point people are going to turn their back at them and say, yeah, that was cool five years ago in the kind of heat of the purpose era. I think they might be facing a lot of criticism going forward. Patagonia, I think their, um, their mission is navel gazing and wrong. Uh, you know, we want to make our home planet uh, or we want to save our home planet, whatever it is to say. Um, but I do think that they actually do something that's quite different from that. I think they're quite often very good at enabling change and they're also very good at delivering products that enable that change. So I think their, their, their purpose 
seems out of touch and it's not really like they're delivering on it. I think they should take a much more enabling approach to their purpose, but somehow they actually do deliver on it. And one last question before I'll just point back to the books. Um, aren't we talking about a different metric for success? Um, BlackRock is, is driving change from the top. Does this new transformative metric scale and how do you measure it? Yeah, I think the question that I was extremely curious about when I when I wrote this book was how do we create change? And how do we create change fast enough? So I wanted to unlock change. I know that we've just, you know, passed the New Year's and I don't know how many of you do New Year's pledges, but I think a lot of us do, right? We want I think to we do and we try and we yeah. try and keep them longer than 10 days. I think that's the <laughs> whole idea with New, Year, New Year's pledges, right? Exactly. It's, it's, it's uh, the, the beginning to bad old habits, right? It's a new beginning to bad old habits. And, yeah. But I think it really does say a lot about change. Um, it really does say a lot about change. And, 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 and that's why for me, we've got to figure out how we create change. And what I see again and again is that the brands who take this supportive, who can help people become approached, are just much better at motivating people to create change. They're much better at helping bridge that purpose gap between the people who say they want to buy from purposeful brands and the people who actually follow through. And so I think for me, at least, I'm, I'm, I'm really on a bigger mission to understand how we create that change at scale. And I, I think we need to kind of redefine the sort of leadership we see in this purpose space, because for some reason, the go-to method has been brand activism, it's been about screaming from every rooftop what your values are, what you believe in. And by the end of the day, I'm down in the supermarket as a, um, you know, I, as a busy Thomas, I don't have a lot of time, but certainly I have all these brands, each of them trying to kind of come with their world bettering pitch. By the end of the day, the brand I want to spend my money on is the brand who actually starts delivering the transformation change that I want to see in my life. The brand that helped me towards that change that's where I want to spend my buck. And that's where I want to be. Um, and that's where I want to stay loyal. Totally get it. Totally get it. And let's, let's, let's point people to your book. If we go to the slide, if you go to thomascolster.com, you'll be able to grab Thomas's book, which is out now. And, um, you know, I've got my new book after a long time coming out. Um, it'd be later in the year and, uh, you know, nine years in the making. And so, you know, <laughs> the whole point of all of this is we want to provoke discussion, we want to provoke thought in and around this topic, because we are out of time, as Thomas said, we need to drive change at scale. So how do we do that? And, you know, we've got to engage with it, and we've got to make the hard decisions, and we've got to work together in new ways to really, you know, shift what looks like a pretty compromised future, um, if we don't. And so, you know, hopefully these perspectives on purpose you know, get you thinking and, and make you aware of pitfalls to avoid and, and hopefully we'll introduce you to other thought leaders and ways of looking at this so you can apply it specific to your industry, your product, your category, your stakeholders and the issues within your industry that are problematic. So thomascolster.com for the hero trap and if you go to leadwithwe.com you can put in your email and you'll um, be the first to know about the new book when it comes out. And also a podcast that I have called leadwithwe.com where we interview a lot of the, you know, the business leaders out there. So I can't thank you enough for your time. You know, everyone is so uh, pulled in so many different directions. You're coping with the kind of the mental sort of uh, assault that is COVID. We're all dealing with our families. People are homeschooling. You're trying to run your businesses. You're trying to keep a culture healthy and happy and resilient. And I really, really appreciate everybody investing their time. If we go off uh, screen share here, I just want to thank Thomas. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thinking for your time in the evening in Copenhagen. And um, here's to a really vibrant, dynamic dialogue that isn't just dialogue, but really translates into a practice that drives meaningful and measurable change. So thank you so much for sharing some thinking today. Thank you so much, Simon. And, and honestly, congratulations on uh, your new book. It's always uh, so much, so much hard work. And I think it's really a testament to uh, how difficult it sometimes is to, uh, 
achieve some of those life goals. It took me three years to write my book. Yeah. And so congratulations on that. And thank it's my you so COVID much. baby. It's my COVID baby. <laughs> exactly. And, and thank you so much for inviting me to this dialogue because I think today there's a real need uh, to have these uh, conversations, uh, to exchange views between Europe, between US, uh, globally, uh, no more bridge, no more, no more walls, more bridges. That's, yeah, more uh, bridges. And also we can't do these discrete efforts in isolation. We've got to get together. We've got to support each other. We've got to kind of move everyone further, faster. And, um, you know, hopefully it's a value to those who have tuned in and, and look forward to sharing more of the same. But Thomas, have a wonderful evening in Copenhagen and we shall stay safe here in LA and I'll see you again soon. Hopefully in person, not too soon. Yeah, not too soon. Exactly. Right. See you, Thomas. Bye-bye. See you.